This is Ari Koretsky, and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. And we are back with another wonderful episode. This week, I am posting a little bit late. I know it's on a Wednesday. I normally do try to get this out on Monday or at least by Tuesday. This week, I have a good excuse. Uh, we're making a bar mitzvah for my son, Shalom, this upcoming Shabbos, Parshas Korach, 2019, Tavshin Ayin Tes. So anyone listening in real time, thank you for the Mazel Tov wishes. And may we all share in many simchas and happy occasions, not only in my own family, but in all of my listeners' families, your families as well, for many years to come. This week is a fantastic interview, and it goes back to one I did at the Olami Global Forum in Toledo, Spain. Mr. Saul Werdiger, the CEO of Outer Stuff, has one of the most interesting companies I think that you'll find anywhere, and certainly in the Jewish world. He is really at the nexus of business and sports athletics uh, in the largest sense. He manufactures jerseys, replica jerseys, and youth wear for basically every major sports league in America. And from that perch has a connection to some of the leaders in the industry, commissioners of sports, owners of sports franchises, heads of major apparel companies like Nike and Under Armour, and so on and so forth. But he does all of that with a pronounced sense of integrity and Jewish pride. And to me, what is most striking about his story is his unflappable commitment to doing the right thing in every circumstance and constantly generating Kiddush Hashem, sanctification of God's name, showing what it means to live by the standards that a Jew is supposed to have in his life, whether that's in business or any other context. And this theme generally is born throughout the interview, but I want to share one vignette that he did not discuss with me, but that I now recall having seen online a couple of years ago, and I was reminded of by my good friend, Rabbi Yisrael Gelber, who forwarded this to me, and this was quoted by someone named Ilan Perchik of Tor Anytime, and he described a story of how Mr. Wadiger received a call from the South Korean ambassador to the United Nations and asked them to go out to lunch. So they went out to a kosher restaurant in Manhattan and Mr. Oh Yoon told him that his daughter, in fact, had worked as a designer interning at Outer Stuff at the company. And Mr. Werdiger had no idea. And he told uh, Mr. Werdiger, he told Saul that previously he had had a very negative impression of Jews, I guess, mostly from afar, and that this completely transformed his opinion. Why? His daughter cited four examples of aspects that were truly striking to her. Number one, every day at 1.30, no matter what was going on in the business, everyone stopped for mincha, afternoon services, prayers. Number two, every Friday, the office would shut down early and everyone would go home to get ready for Shabbat and everyone was given off even if they weren't Jewish per se. Also, every person who came into the office, and there were many who came into the office seeking charity, was treated with dignity and respect and given a donation, a check to leave the office. And finally, she said that she herself was treated with the utmost respect and dignity. And because of this experience, Mr. Yun said, first of all, he wanted to compensate the full salary that his daughter had earned. And Saul said, certainly not. He refused that. She worked hard and earned that salary. But he said, more importantly, that as a voting member in the UN, he had on three occasions now abstained from voting on resolutions against Israel only because of this experience that his daughter had. And in one particular case, he was the pivotal ninth vote needed to pass a certain motion against Israel. And again, it did not pass this resolution because of his abstention. And so again, seeing the incredible power of everyday actions of doing the right thing, of living with 
tremendous integrity in business and all other areas of life that Saul Werdiger and his company represent. I think you'll very much enjoy this conversation. It's a bit shorter than some of my other interviews because Saul flew into Spain for literally a day or maybe a day and a half, if that. He was in and out and we had a 30 or 35, maybe 40 minute window to cram in this conversation and so we did our best and we really got a lot packed into that short time uh, but we didn't get our usual hour hour and a half that I like to have with with people but we again uh, he's from Brooklyn he's in New York are we able to, to go quickly and hit I think most of the key points both in terms of his biography and his business experiences and Jewish impact so I think you'll again really enjoy this conversation with the outer stuff CEO from Toledo, Spain, Mr. Saul Werdiger. We are here with businessman and community leader, Saul or Shlomo Werdiger. How are you? Baruch Hashem. Very uh, inspired and happy to be here in Toledo and uh, really uh, thrilled to participate in this unbelievable uh, Olami uh, convention. Incredible. So we're, we're thrilled to have you on and I feel like I'm going to be torturing you a little bit here by having you repeat your uh, your life story as you've done I think already twice today but uh, we're gonna do it anyway because this is a whole new audience and uh, a wide audience that's not here with us in Toledo Spain so take it from the top and tell us where you're from where you grew up and uh, and a little bit about your family history well uh, you know I grew up in uh, I grew up in Bar Park uh, a son a child of uh, Holocaust survivors as a matter of fact it's very impactful just last week um, my father, Zechariah uh, Lavracha, was was a Holocaust survivor. Was in Buchenwald, was freed by the Americans. Actually, together with Rabbi Lau, who's uh, here with us uh, also in, in in Spain. But just two weeks ago, they they uh, they released the, the Nazis Yemachshimum. The Germans released new documents, 2.2 million new documents of the meticulous records they kept. You know, during during the Holocaust, it's amazing. So I had somebody research for me, and and I found the uh, documents of my father and my uncle and, and my grandfather, whom I'm named after, and they have exactly the dates, the the dates they were admitted into as prisoners, their prisoner numbers. It even has the dates that they died. I I found that my my father kept the yard site of my grandfather, who I'm named after, and I see the records, and he actually is not the right yard site. Wrong day. The, the, wow. the, the wrong day. So you know, this is that, that's the we grew up. We grew up as children of Holocaust survivors, and it comes with a, a deep sense of of responsibility of 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 making sure that that that, that Chassel Shom this doesn't happen again. And as I told the group this morning, it also comes with a deep achrayis to care for the klal, to care for other people. And uh, we grew up in the shadows of that generation, broken people, and we saw what, uh, what could happen. And we work as hard as we possibly can to be Mekadashem Shemayim to ensure that uh, something like that doesn't happen again. And, uh, your, parent, your family was from a Hasidic? Uh, yeah, my family was, was from, uh, from the Ger Hasidim. Uh, as a matter of fact, I still have a very uh, close uh, relationship with, with, with Gur, with Ger. Uh, my father comes from a from a Gera family. My my mother is uh, she should be well. She should live and be well. She's she she she's with us and and doing terrific. Thank wow, God, Baruch Hashem. But uh, she also comes from a Hasidic background. Yes, yeah, so we have some Hasidic background. Even though uh, I did not go to Hasidic yeshivas, I went to, as a child to yeshiva called Torah Semes. Afterwards, I went to Torah Vadas. Uh, which just celebrated its hundredth. I saw that uh, it's hundred, article. It's, it's hundred, that, yeah. yeah. So yeah. So I, I that's our background. Uh, Polish, at least my father was, and um, you know the the the, the sense of of clown, the sense of of giving over to the next generation. I sold over a story here before about how I testified in Polish court, and and about about a shul that uh, I, I'm involved uh, when Rabbi Besser, I'm a famous Rabbi Haskell Besser, was nifta. I took over his job as, as the chairman, it's called the, the WJRO, and FUDS, it's, it's to keep the preservation of all the Mekoymes Akdosh and the Botechayim, the cemeteries and shuls in Poland. And I told over, I testified in court, and this Polish judge, after a day of testimony, said to me, let me explain to you, so how is it possible that you were never in this synagogue? Were you as a child? I said, no, I wasn't old enough. And just, how could you come here 75, 70 years later and and testify and be so passionate about something that you had no, nothing to do with. You were never there. And I, and I said to her and the same thing. And I told these young people that 
we religious people feel that unless we have a connection to the past, we have no future. The, the past is, is what it's all about. So when trying to imbue and, 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 and to try to talk to these young people here who are the, hopefully the future leaders of, of Am Yisrael all over the world, it's amazing. There's people here from Argentina, Brazil, Russia, yeah, France, Australia, yeah. how many? 20 oh, oh, yeah. Over 20-something countries and trying to tell them and give them a connection to the past. They're all young kids. Even this generation doesn't know the past. They don't really, they're living for today. They're living the thing. So I'm happy that I can be part of this and and try to give them over some Messiah, give them over some some limited <laughs> Messiah that I could give them and help them, guide them uh, of what they need to do to become the next future leaders in Claudius. Yeah, I guess you see yourself as a real bridge between that past world. Yeah, and I'm a normal bridge, you know. They, they, <laughs> they, no, no, meaning that they, they, they hear from, it's, it's important, I'm here with some of other friends of mine in the business community because they, to hear from Rabbonim, to hear from the rabbis, from the teachers, that they expect. They expect a, a rabbi to get up and tell them about this and about the, you know how to be more religious and more observant and more learned and to learn more Torah. That they expect. When, but to have business people give them a message and show them that you could be successful in the business world and at the same time not compromise on any of your Jewish values, that's, I think, very impactful to them. And as when they came over and talked to me, you know, I'm in the sports world, so they hear they, have, they want to hear all kinds of stories. And how do you do this? They play games on Shabbos. What do you do about kosher food? These practical lessons yeah. from other business leaders that are here, are, I think, are, are very important. And, and it's something that I try to do as often as I can because, as I said, they expect to hear this from the rabbinic leadership, but not from uh, business people in a practical uh, way. Absolutely. So let's go to that business uh, career of yours, which is quite unique and, and I think definitely has a lot of name recognition with a lot of the people that you're involved with. I heard you name drop uh, Roger Goodell, the NFL commissioner, among others, and that's you know something that I think strikes people as very interesting, for sure. Um, how did you get into business? Were you studying, you know, you were studying in a yeshiva and then decided it was time to go out and earn a living and you started just selling clothing? What was the, what was the genesis? Yeah, listen, it's, it's, a, it's a strange, <laughs> it's, it's strange story. It's Ashkocha Pratis, you know, I didn't, uh, I, you know, yeah, I was in yeshiva, I in Tarev I graduated at those days, I did go to, to college at night. During the summer, I got a summer job, I wanted to earn some extra money, we didn't, uh, you know, come from money, and, and uh, I, I was in Etisrol, learning in yeshiva for a few years, I wanted to go back, my father said, you want to go back, go make a few dollars, and you'll have money to go back, I just sent you for two years, to so, <laughs> your turn. So I took a summer job with a friend of mine who had a brother in a, an accounting firm, and the accounting firm specialized in the garment center, so... You know, I took a summer job, I went up there, I did some menial work and some stuff, and this, these people, uh, of course, I worked with my yarmulke, they knew I was religious, and they liked me, they, they, they somehow liked me, and they called me back for a second summer job. And uh, I was still in yeshiva, and then I was getting married, and they, they called me back, and they said, listen, if you want a full-time employment, and they offered me a full-time employment, and that's how I started off in the shmata business, in the, <laughs> in the garment business, it was a manufacturer of, of women's coats, and eventually, it's all this old story, I, uh, but eventually uh, um, I had an opportunity to, to go out on my own and all of the people that I worked with and, and all of the bars that got to know me and, and eventually we developed a mutual respect. I was an enigma at that time. I was the only boy walking around with the Amok in that industry at that time. So everybody kind of knew me, Rabbi Saul, you know, kind of a nickname <laughs> that stuck. But eventually I had an opportunity. Uh, I, from that job, I went to a different job and had an opportunity to to buy out the person that I worked for. He wanted to retire. Baruch Hashem, after that, we, somebody came, uh, somebody, again, somebody in our community that, that davened with me that always said, Shlomi, if you ever, I'd love to be a partner and go into business. And he kind of bankrolled me and financed me. And Baruch Hashem after that. And then eventually, I, how, I don't know, we made some contacts in the sports world. My first license was with Major League Baseball. And, um, you know, and, after that, we developed a relationship with Major League Baseball. They were happy with what we were doing. Eventually, we got into some of the other leagues and the other sports. So, right, so uh, you know, right now, uh, Baruch Hashem, we have uh, contracts with all of the major sports leagues. And, uh, and that's really, that's our business uh, really shifted to, to a sports-oriented uh, type business, which, as we all know, is not a, 
again, it's not a Jewish uh, business. It's not. Uh, it's not. Well, many of the owners are, are Jewish. <laughs> yeah, many of the owners are Jewish, but yeah, but you, you can make an impact. As I said, the, those businesses, there's games on Shabbos, there's yeah. activity on Shabbos, there's games on Yom If we somehow manage, and that's the lesson I try to tell these guys that if you feel that being religious, keeping Shabbos, eating kosher, doing those things are going to hold you back from accomplishing anything that you want to accomplish. I'm, me and my children are the classic example of that's not true because we're in the most koyesha business, but still Bar Hashem. We, we do all the things. We, we, we haven't compromised any of our Jewish values. If anything, you know, we've helped and, and brought a lot of people who we are in contact with back into the into the fold so so that's really the message that i that i impart to these kids and to i speak a lot for whether it's all me in new york or i bring some there are people here from asian london they come up every summer i have an internship program in my office where i bring up wow. young college jewish kids awesome. and try to show them that you could be in a in a, in in the business world without compromising any of your uh, jewish values it's you know when you say you do contracts with the different leagues so that means you're you're producing uniforms for them and yeah yeah we produce all of the all of the youth all of the youth uh, what they wear on field is what they wear on the court they're diff- that's customized apparel but anything right. that you see in the stores so whether you go into uh, the store box whatever, i always assume nike and adidas and whatever produce those things yeah they well they, they yeah they make what the players wear but they're interested more in the exposure and the marketing they they're interested in selling a lot of sneakers and a lot of their own apparel this is a very complex business in terms of so many thousands of players and teams and colors and so we developed an expertise and we're good at that but so if you walk into you know in new york and models or right. dick sporting goods and you want to buy a jersey most likely that's our that's what we make officially licensed right. jerseys and right. things like that right. do you end up working with the other <coughs> with the major you know apparel companies in terms of Nike sure sure like we work closely with nike and with adidas and with uh, those are the two big ones under right armor now. as well or yeah friendly with the under armor we worked a little bit currently right now we're not it, the brand that's on the field is not chosen by us that's chosen by the league right once that's chosen by the league, we work with them, so we don't we don't decide who gets. That's those are contracts that are worth billions of dollars in terms of exposure and right. marketing. But once they pick either Nike or Adidas or Puma or Under Armour, whoever it is, then we start working with them at that Got time. So. I mentioned Under Armour just because I, I work. My main job is a rabbi at University of Maryland. Right. Kevin Plank. Yeah, I know. I know. Kev, yeah, I know Kevin uh, quite well. He's a good guy. Uh, I know his kids, his family. I know his. Is I, I know most of the people in the industry, and I would tell you that the fact Phil that Knight I, and all those, yeah, yeah the, the fact that I do wear my yarmulke and the fact that we are different than everybody else in the industry stands us apart and makes us recognizable. And I said, as long as we conduct ourselves in the proper way and make a kiddush Hashem, a chas v'shol, not a chel Hashem, you could make a big difference by by uh, by doing what we do. Along those lines, I wanted to ask you to uh, repeat a story that you said uh, to the whole group. Uh, of about 600 students just a few moments ago um, and that was a story of integrity when you were in your early days um, selling women's coats before the, the uh, before the uniform business yeah the integrity the the yeah the, listen the integrity that you have and we know if you're a orthodox especially and you wear a yarmulke we're, you know we're, we're kept to a high standard and you have to be careful and you have to make sure that you keep those high standards and there was times, I, the story that I told us, there was a time in early on in my career where we had some very disastrous uh, seasons. We were very, very in a very uh, precarious financial situation. And um, you know, the, what a normal person would do in that situation was uh, would go up to the bank and, and plead and, and, and paint a rosy picture and come up with some financial projections that are really not, uh, not attainable. And that's what somebody would do. But I, I didn't do that. I felt that that would be really lying. And, and as much as I had a Yitzhahara to do it because I wanted to stay in business, uh, I had at that time a CFO, uh, just a wonderful person, Rabbi Yoyna Blumenfrucht was his name, Zechayin Levrach, he passed away. And he said, Shlaimi, uh, Sal, we are who we are. We cannot go up and, and paint a false picture. So... Uh, we went up there. We were lucky. They they were shocked. <laughs> Anybody would come up and tell them how bad the situation <laughs> really is. But at the end of the day, 20 years later, this same banker I was involved in a very, very, very big deal where it would have required probably 
three or four months of due diligence, this banker saw me, said, Saul, you're the guy that we're involved with? And I said, yes. And he turned around to all the other people. He says, no due diligence required. If this guy could have gone out of business and he came up and he couldn't lie, now that he's, thank God, in a good business, a successful business, and he's coming uh, to us and he's showing these projections, I take whatever he said at face value. So that's really the, you know, you have, you have to be in time. I'll, I'll tell you a great story that I didn't say, and I hope people would listen to this and say this, you know, we... You know, we sold a percentage of our business to a large private equity firm. And, um, you know, our, our company was, uh, was charitable. You know, we gave a lot of stock from the business. And when these people came in, they said, so listen, you know, you, you're going to have partners now. And charity is something you do on your own. You know, we don't, we are, you, we're our partners. You can't, you can't uh, give stock from the company account. You'll do it privately. And I said, that sounds fair. They're, they're, not, uh, they're, they're not Jewish people. And why should they give the yeshivas and call them things that we, <laughs> things that we did? So I said, okay. And I came on that night and I had a discussion with my CFO. Who I said, that time was also from Jew. We discussed and we said, can't be. And I called up uh, this, this uh, potential uh, private equity investor. I said, sorry, if, if that's really the case, we have to drop out of the deal. And the guy said to me, so are you crazy? You know, it's a big deal. There's a lot of money on the table. Why? And I said, because we're, we're honest people. I can't sell you a company that's going to fail. He says, what are you going to fail? You have a successful company. And I said, yes, but what you don't understand is the success of the company is because we're, we give charity from the business. We're a charitable company. And if the company is no longer going to be charitable, I can't guarantee you that we're going to have the same success that we have today. So I can't sell you a company that could very well not be successful in the future. He looked at me like I was crazy. He thought I was from Mars. I said, listen, I'll make a compromise with you. Let's say the company gave $5 charity till now. Let's only give $1 charity. But we have to give charity. They said, so I'll... I don't think we've known. And they went ahead. They took it up the. They took it up the ladder to their <laughs> to their management. And today we are a case history, in this private equity, investment banking world. They they said if Saul believes if they believe that strongly that the company has to give charity. And so today, thank God the company continues to be successful. But but we firmly believe as do they now, that it's because the company uh, is charitable. So that's that's a that's a. Great story for people that are starting off in business. You have to understand where your success comes from. And, and it, it, don't go around thinking, yodi. nobody, of course, the Rabban Shalom you know, smiled on you and, and gave you Hatzlacha. You have to know where it really comes from. And don't start thinking that it's, that it's your own doing. So I, I think this is a great story. And it's a story that usually when I tell the, 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 these young people starting off in business has a tremendous uh, impact on them. Can you share some anecdotes from your interaction with the sports world? You know, I think in America, there's this real adulation and really almost uh, worship of that world of the athlete, the sports society. And, you know, it's something you've been in from the inside. What have you seen there and, and what is, what's been your experience as an insider? <laughs> it's a different world. They are. It's a different, uh, it's a different type of... <laughs> Listen, like, like anything else in life, there's some really great great people in that business and there's some people that uh, we, we try as much as possible to stay away from we don't have that much interaction but I will tell you a cute story and I, I think it went I told this over once I think I spoke to a group at, of Russian children at Beragol I think I think and this story went viral and I, I, I told them this story that uh, that uh, the Super Bowl was in uh, I think it was in Miami one year and uh, I got up in the morning and I, I went out to Davin and I had my talis under my arm, I was going to, and at the next next room, and the door opens up simultaneously, so and this very famous uh, NFL quarterback comes out, and uh, um, and he says to me, Rabbi, uh, good Sabbath to you. And I said, Good Sabbath to you. I told him, I called him by his name. He says, Rabbi, you know, you're a holy man. I heard about you. I, you're a religious man. He says, and I'm in between jobs right now. I, I was the quarterback for this team, and mm -hmm. I'm looking for a new position, which was all over the papers. Everybody knew it was true, and. Uh, could you give me a blessing? So I, I don't know what to say to him. I said, I'm really not. He says, come on, Saul, give me, give me a blessing. So I took his hand and I shook his hand and I said, uh, I gave him some heebie-jeebie. I don't know what I said, but I, I gave him some blessing. That was the end of that. And uh, uh, two or three months later, my secretary said, Saul, this guy's on the phone for you, this famous <laughs> 
quarterback and he gets on the phone. He says, Saul, you're the greatest. I just got the biggest contract I ever got in my life. And I became the quarterback for a big, big uh, East Coast team and tens and tens of millions of dollars. And I really want to thank you. If there's anything I could do for you, I want to thank you. He says, could I make, you know, could I make some sort of a donation? So he says, sure, donation. I'm not turning down a donation. I gave him the name of some organization uh, and he sent in a very beautiful check. And that was the end of that. Fast forward a, a year later, it's next year Super Bowl, and I'm at Super Bowl, and I see him coming to me, and he has like a whole group of guys behind him. <laughs> all the unemployed all the unemployed, all the unemployed, and he says, that's the guy, that's all. He says, come on, guys, line up. Let's get a blessing, get a blessing from Saul. So, so uh, that's a cute story, but uh, it just comes to show you that, that uh, so, so the, yeah, listen, uh, you try to, you have to be very careful in that environment. It's not a, great environment I have my children in the business with me it's not a great environment but as long as like i said over here if you have clarity and if you have uh, you know who we are we don't get cold with sugar with you know <laughs> trying to trying to, to to emulate them just the opposite we 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 hope that by the impact we make they're they're looking at having respect for us i imagine that your children grew up getting to go to really cool sporting events or see things or meet people how did you sort of uh, demystify it for them. Yeah, I mean, listen, the kids growing up not, uh, you know, eventually growing up, I really try to minimize it as much as humanly possible. Yeah, once in a while, take them to a to a game, but we didn't, uh, this wasn't a business that we discussed over the Shabbos table, that's for sure. And uh, so I really try to keep everybody, uh, you know, grounded and, and even killed. But once they got married and they, they finished the learning uh, a few years or whatever, and, it's role, and they joined the business, that's a different story. So, but I'm hoping that they, they uh, I set an example for them and what's really important and what's not important not to go sugar and overboard. And uh, listen, sports is interesting. It is a healthy outlet. I take a lot of students and my sons and we, we, we help a lot of children that are sick take them to, to games. Uh, uh, sports is still something that, that's, that's coveted by, by all of them. And so as long as you keep it real and keep it grounded and you don't uh, you understand what's really important. Uh, so yeah, the children are involved in the business, but again, we're not you know, overly you know, impressed with, with, with this. Uh, we do it for a panasa, but uh, do we enjoy it? Uh, I enjoy it if the right team wins. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me a little bit about your community involvement. I know that you've become a very, very significantly connected to several organizations, in particular, I go to Israel of America, which maybe you can tell listeners what that is. And uh, for those who are not familiar with some of the activism and the advocacy and, and the programming of that organization, and, and generally what are sort of the, the causes that drive you most passionately? Well, you know, I go to Israel, you, you coming from Maryland know how strong we have a, a strong uh, organization in Maryland. We yeah, just Rabbi had the Sadwin. Rabbi Sadwin, yeah. Ariel sure. Sadwin's a tzaddik. And uh, we just had an event where we had the governor come down. Listen, we're an advocacy group for, for, for representing Claudia Yisrael, protecting all religious freedoms in America, advocating for the yeshivas and in, in, in the halls of Congress and in, in city halls. And look at we we accomplished uh, Baruch Hashem in, in Ohio. I mean, it's unbelievable that the Cleveland community is growing. We got vouchers. 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 Today, the biggest single problem facing uh, the next generation of Claudia Yisrael probably is how limited is tuitions. It's a major problem, and we're out there in the in the forefront, advoc- advocating for as much as we can for help for the yeshivas. Uh, it's it's hard. There's a separation of church and state. Some states were more successful than others. Strong teachers union against it, but again, on a daily basis, protecting religious freedoms. Whether it's bris mila, now we had a big situation. We've been involved with uh, uh, on on the education front, where the the state and the city are stepping in and trying to to set parameters and guidelines for for length of how much we're supposed to be learning Lamud Echol and what Lamud Echol English is, studies, English yeah. studies, and it's it's difficult, but we have an unbelievable dedicated uh, staff. Uh, Good is led by uh, Rabbi Chaim David Zwebel, and we have offices in eight or ten states across the country, and these guys are the real, this is the re- they're the real McCoy. These are the ones that could have had a real successful uh, life in, in, in business and in law and, and really drank the the Kool-Aid for the for Yiddishkeit and are out there on the front lines. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge uh, organization. Uh, we probably bring in, you know, over the course of the years, billions of dollars to yeshivas um, and, and, and the myriad of other things that we, that we work for. Right now, we're in the process of 
planning for the next Siyam Hashas. Explain what that is for, for those not familiar. If I'm not familiar, is uh, actually actually my, my father, uh, Blessed Mary Zechon of Rocha, learned from this yeshiva, and yeshiva is Chachmi Lublin. Wow. And uh, there was a rabbi there, Rabbi Shapiro, who realized that the war is coming, the Jews are going to be spread out all over the world, and he wanted to develop something, a, a system of learning, of studying, that there's commonality, no matter where you go. So if I'm traveling from the America to Argentina or, or Spain, maybe. or Spain, <laughs> that's right. Wherever you go and you walk into any shul in the world, any synagogue in the world, there's somebody there. If everybody's learning the same page every day, there's a, you can walk in, you don't know anybody, you sit down, you can study, you can become part of, the, of that particular synagogue community. And it was a brilliant idea. And, and so we started, it's called Dafa Yomi, which is a page a day. And uh, it took off after the war. Uh, I remember the first uh, Siyam Hashas in New York, there was maybe 5,000 people. I think it was in some felt form, some some small venue in New York City. Every seven and a half years. Yeah, it takes, so if you learn a page a day, it takes seven and a half years to complete. Seven and a half years is, of learning is a huge, huge accomplishment. And when you finish that, you, it's called the Siyam Hashas, the completion of the Shas. But uh, um, it's grown from 5,000 to 10,000 to 15,000 to to 25,000, two times ago we took two venues, which is about 40 or 50,000, and the last time, which is almost seven years ago now, we took uh, MetLife Stadium, where we had, uh, Baruch Hashem, 92,000 uh, people. Uh, which learning. I was one, by the way. <laughs> Good, great, great experience, and and uh, uh, there's some very dedicated, uh, huge staff that's working towards the next year, Mashas, which will be incredible, probably be in 200 cities, 30, 40 countries, they have some innovative programs uh, uh, that they came up. One's called Masmide Adav, which is getting young kids to learn Mishnayas. I think we're up to maybe 30 or 40,000 kids who've registered already to complete something in honor of the Siyam Hashas. We have Chevrei uh, Asiyam, where hundreds of shuls, hundreds of synagogues got together and said, we don't study this, but at least for the Siyam Hashas, let the whole shul finish, collectively, collectively yeah. finish. So some very innovative things. We We think that... Uh, the next year, Mashas, between the venues that we have, uh, we have one indoor venue, one outdoor venue. It's going to be on New Year's Day, right? It's a New Year, yeah, it's 2020. A New, a New Year's Day. We ask everybody to please stop them for us. That the weather, <laughs> no, no. Last, <laughs> I remember last time it was supposed to rain, right? That's right. And it, it stopped it as stopped soon as it soon started. As Mashas, yeah. Amazing. So, uh, we hope this is a huge, uh, makes a huge impact on learning all over the world. And, and it, it's also, it's, it's, it's achdus, it's unity. You come to the Met Life, I'm sure you remember from last time, all facets of, of Jewish life participate, and it's a beautiful thing to see. The Torah reunites us all, and it's a beautiful thing to see that uh, everybody all together, the enthusiasm and the tremendous amount of uh, Torah study that's being uh, brought about by the by this uh, Siyam Hashas. I have to thank you because from that event, I was so inspired, I actually started myself, beautiful. and I'm still going. Great. And uh, I'm coming up, so on my first uh, <laughs> p- participation as a celebrant, hopefully, in the, uh, in the next round. Beautiful. Um, we, we have to start closing because we have, uh, we're short on time, unfortunately. I wish we had hours more. What are some of the future projects that you would like to work on? What are the things that bother you, you know, that keep you awake at night about the Jewish people in terms of your own activism? What's sort of the next frontier for you uh, in your activity in the community? Yeah, so that uh, brings us to one of the reasons I come here, and it, it's the next generation. Today, listen, there's never been more uh, chesed and more uh, uh, tremendous uh, things being done in our communities. There's a huge amount of stalker being going out, chesed organizations, but Klal Yisrael Askonim, that's my passion. My passion is to develop, it's great, my son's involved in this fund, get kids to go to camp and raises fortunes of money, send kids that can't afford it to a summer camp. And that's great, don't get me wrong, that's wonderful. There's so many local projects, chesed things that are being done. But my fear is, is where's the next generation of Askanim to worry about all of Kalalis or activists? And that's hard because today the generation wants instantaneous gratification. You know, whether it's, you know, the emails, the text, everything on the second, on the minute. Work that we do and I go, this is well, and Kalalis will work. Not just that, is you have to plant seeds. It takes time. You come over here to Olami, trying to inspire the next leaders of Kalalis. Well, you don't do something today and I'm trying to talk to them and tell them how things that I did 10 years ago come back and take, took 10 years till I really saw the benefits from it. And that's my concern. My concern is, is that the next generation understands the importance uh, of, 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 of Klal Yisrael work and, and building the next generation of future Jewish leaders. How can we do that? 
I don't, going out, inspiring them, making sure that they, you know, today kids, the, the younger generation, look up to different, look up to different things. So I think it's important. I, I talk to all my chaver myself that we set a right examples that. That, that the, the examples we send, and they said you could be successful, but still care about Klal Yisrael, care about the community, that it goes hand in hand. And we preach and say that, that no question that most of us, we, we, we say that our success in whatever limited fashion we were successful in, success doesn't only mean monetarily, but whatever we're successful in, comes from the fact that we give back, that we uh, got involved in the community. And you have to make the right, the right, uh, right show. listen, you go to, it's a bigger Christ. Go to Washington or, or or Albany or or City Hall, across all states. We have to make sure that we're conducting ourselves uh, and making a kiddush Hashem every day of our lives. And I'm concerned. I want to make sure that that continues. It's so important, especially listen. We see today what's going on. This tremendous rise of anti-Semitism. Uh, it's really scary. I, I travel a lot. I, I, in Europe is terrific. I was speaking here to some people from. From, from France and, and, and some people from Argentina, look what's going on in, in, in Hungary, in Poland, and even in America. In America, lately, uh, the anti Semitism uh, has, 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 has risen again. It's weird. Just it's weeks ugly. after Poway. Yeah, it's weird. It's ugly head. So we have to make sure that we're at the front lines, that we're not giving them any excuses to, to, to say, you know, to, to talk disparagingly about Jews. And we have to go out there and, and, and make the right impressions. and you know, listen, just because, you know, uh, I tell everybody, just because these people are different than us doesn't mean we have to be indifferent. And mm-hmm. we, have to, we have to show that we do, and we do care. Our job is to, to as, I, as I keep on repeating, is to be Mekadoshem Shemayim and show the world that, that we are, we're held to a higher standard and we deserve that. When they say God's chosen people, that's not something that comes likely. We have to earn it and deserve it and to keep, to keep that title. How do you feel when you see people violating that, desecrating that reputation. Unfortunately, that's what seems to grab the headlines. Okay, well, so I, I listen, it, it does grab the headlines. You know, you can have 200 non-Jewish people do something and it doesn't make, a, it doesn't make page 32. We do, we have one person that does it and it's page one news. And that's something we all have to understand. It's a message we try to, try to get out there all the time. All of everything that we do wrong is exaggerated and is brought to the, to the forefront. So we have to we have to be that much more careful and we have to uh, have to be that much more cognizant that anything we do, they're looking for for a terrorist or looking for an excuse to to be disparaging about us. So it's being at the forefront and being Jewish and being one of the Rabban Shalom's uh, uh, Amma it comes with an awesome responsibility and we have to preach to the young guys. They have to be uh, have to realize that and be super careful to make sure that they don't do anything that's going to hurt the, that image. Well, Mr. Saul Werdiger, we're so honored that you've come all this way to Spain to share that message, but also that you've spent your entire life dedicated to spreading the sanctity of of the Jewish people and God's name, and in many different arenas, not just the athletic arenas, although those are certainly a big part of it, but in all your affairs, and it's it's a real honor to know that we have people like you out there building that reputation and spreading that light in such a beautiful way. So thank you so much for that and thank you for joining us. And thank you for having me and I hope that uh, that some people listening to this will really uh, take this message seriously and, and hope that I could uh, accomplish something uh, in helping the, the, the continuity of, uh, of Cloud Israel. Amen. Thank you. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at JewsYouShouldKnow. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash JewsYouShouldKnow. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews you should know.